Um, thank you. I'm going to take my, take my jacket off because I mean business. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. And um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's a real pleasure to speak to an audience uh, of interested people. And uh, I'm sure you all have your own views about the environment and contested science and how science plays into that. Um, but as Ian said, uh, there's, um, I think there's a story to be told here about um, how science has historically played a role in, uh, in, in helping us get to where we are with the environment. And there's a story to be told about how it might do that in the future. Um, and I, I suppose I, through my role as Chief Scientific Advisor at DEFRA, kind of sit um, right at the hub, a lot of the decision making. Um, and when we talk about communicating contested science, or when I talk about communicating contested science, it's maybe a little different to how Ian talks about it, because Ian is out there in the public eye actually um, uh, talking about these sorts of things to many millions of people through, uh, through the, the medium of television. Um, I, on the other hand, I'm closeted away in the corridors of Whitehall and to some extent Westminster as well, um, trying to communicate this to people who are at the centre of decision making and who have some very, very difficult decisions to make a lot of the time. Um, uh, so I, I've been let out of my, my little cage and uh, I'm speaking in a public forum now. Um, and that's a wonderful thing for me to be able to do because actually it, I don't do it uh, as often as I'd like to do it. Um, the other thing is that as a, uh, even though I'm a scientist and uh, a, an academic, uh, or at least I like to think of myself as an academic, I still have an academic position for one day a week, but it, it never really boils down to me actually getting down to uh, uh, academic studies in the way I traditionally did them. Um, I uh, still um, have a sort of hands tied behind my back slightly because uh, I know a lot of what's going on in government uh, and I have to be a little careful sometimes about what I, what I say in public. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I want to be as candid as, and as, as, as open as possible. Um, and also, being an academic, I actually see what I do uh, now in government as part of my research. Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, through, through my own practice what is actually going on in people's minds and what the psychology is of, uh, of the problems that are being dealt with and how science fits into that. So I'm both the communicator of science and uh, the person who's actually doing the research. And actually, interestingly, for the first time in my life, I find myself the subject of research because chief scientific advisors are, from some points of view in social science, quite interesting creatures to study. Uh, so I find myself becoming uh, part of that study process. So um, I thought the... Is this still working? Yes. I thought the best way of, um, uh, of trying to tackle this subject of, of communicating communicating contested science was to kind of take you through what I do as a chief scientific advisor and take you through a, a sort of a story about what science does in government, um, uh, sort of, the, uh, sort of the, yeah, the role of science in government, uh, the role of chief scientific advisor, and then take you to some examples about where I think science might be used and misused, uh, and that's through case studies. And you saw in the introductory slide I had a badger up there. Uh, I also had uh, the uh, molecular structure of the neonicotinoid pesticides and bees, and there are an awful lot more. Um, I, could, I could list of uh, uh, plant disease, tree disease, uh, cholera, uh, ash dieback. Ian mentioned uh, flooding. Uh, I could mention horse meat as well. Uh, the whole issue of air quality uh, at the moment is, is highly contentious. Um, and there's a host of, host of other ones as well uh, that, that I, could, I could list off, almost all of which are difficult and contested. And part of the reason why they're contested is that the science is actually uncertain. And as a scientist 
try to describe where the certainty sits and also where the uncertainty sits. And the, uh, the area of uncertainty is the area where politics plays. It's the area where people can actually um, try to push their own views um, uh, and, and, and try to uh, uh, capture the agenda. Um, and actually, that's where politics sits. And as I will say, one of the biggest messages I want to get over tonight is that, um, in my view, scientists should not play in that space. And I'll explain why in due course. So the role of science in government. Well, the first message is that government is hard work. And it genuinely is hard work. And uh, I didn't realize it until I moved into government just how hard it is. Um, uh, I think I had a, I, I, I was actually one of an academic who engaged with government a lot while I was doing my academic studies. Um, uh, so I worked alongside government and I thought I understood government and I suppose that's partly why I got the job was that I was engaged uh, already. But I had a lot to learn and I hadn't realized quite how much uh, I had to learn. The way I like to put it is that um, in the three walks of life, there's commerce, academia, and government, roughly. Um, in commerce, you only tackle the problems where you think you can make money out of them. In academia, we actually pick up the problems we think we can actually make progress with and potentially solve. In government, you're left with all the rest, and you have no choice. The, the problems come at you, and you have to deal with them one way or another. Um, and that's pretty tough. So problems are wicked, they're messy, um, they, they, they contain all sorts of different um, components, uh, some of which are scientifically driven, some of which are very socially driven, some are political, some are economic. Uh, so they are, they are this mishmash of messy stuff. Um, and what, what I like to see as, as a scientist is science actually seeing that mishmash and playing the, 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 the role that science, I think, has to play about providing the information that science can, uh, uh, can provide in, in as objective a way as possible, and also trying to get people to understand the kind of mishmash that they're, they're, they're actually dealing with. So there's, 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 there's a big difficulty about trying to deal with problems um, in government, and almost all the problems that government deals with are, are of that wicked type. Now, what do I mean by wicked problem? Well, for those of you who are mathematically orientated, it's a non-linear problem. It's one which doesn't behave in the ways that you would expect. And what's more, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's an unbelievably frustrating kind of problem because by finding a solution, you create more of a problem. So the problem never goes away, basically. So that's, that's kind of the definition of a wicked problem. Um, there's also an, an issue about knowing when science can help and when it can't help. Um, I think many people think that, oh, if we only just put more science into it, then we'd solve the problem. Um, Sometimes that's the case, but not always, by a long way. Um, uh, and understanding when science can and cannot help is, is, is really important. So uh, the problem with, with not understanding that is that scientists can sometimes step into the middle of a problem and say, oh, I can solve that for you. Uh, they end up over-promising, and they don't deliver. Uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, and, you know, we as scientists, needless to say, we are confident in our own abilities, and we should be confident in our own abilities, but actually we've got to be very realistic. Um, sometimes we talk theoretically about problems, and uh, that's not a bad thing, but uh, the people who are dealing with some of these problems in government have real problems in real time, and they need real solutions, so theory uh, doesn't help an awful lot. Uh, a lot of the problems have high uncertainty associated with them, uh, uh, um, and we need to be realistic about that. And, and one of the jobs of scientists is actually sometimes to say there is a huge amount of uncertainty here. Here's what we know. Here's the vast amount we don't know, and then walk back from the problem and allow people to deal with that. Um, and that comes to my final point on the slide here. It's about 
scientists helping people to define the problems that they're dealing with, and being able to step back and look at the, 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 the bigger picture. Um, and I, I was sitting uh, in a, a meeting of the DEFRA Executive Committee, who is the, the senior management that runs, runs the whole of DEFRA the other day, and they, they were all um, kind of very focused, needless to say, on EU exit problems. Um, and it, it, it won't come as a surprise to anybody to, 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 to know the extent to which DEFRA as a Department of State uh, is, is affected by EU exit. It's affected in a very significant way. Um, more than 80% of the policies that DEFRA is responsible for uh, have been delivered from Brussels in the past, and, and, that's, and that's obviously going to change. Uh, so there are huge challenges for a department like DEFRA. Um, but I, I think I made myself slightly unpopular by, at the end of this, this really very sort of difficult, but actually in usual civil service uh, terms, uh, well-managed meeting, I just s s said, and of course this is just a blip on the, on the horizon of problems that we have, because we've still got um, uh, uh, resource efficiency problems and we've still got uh, global warming to deal with and all the issues around, uh, around that. And those are really the big problems we have to deal with in the long run. So this is about, you know, going back to the, uh, the, the, the subject of the Institute here, uh, it's about global sustainability and DEFRA has a responsibility for delivering uh, to that. Uh, so we can't, so as, as a scientist, my role is sometimes to jerk people out of the immediate, dealing with the immediate problems and firefighting and say, actually, there's a bigger picture there. We mustn't lose sight of that. Um, and actually, uh, to, to be, to be uh, clear, the, 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 the senior civil servants who I deal with and the ministers actually usually appreciate that. Depends if I get the timing right or not. Um, so... Just, just sort of extending that slightly about the role of science and government. Um, I mean, I've already indicated that science is really sometimes quite a small part of the problem. Um, and when I, I, I've called it the parameter space here. Uh, and of course, every problem has lots and lots of different, uh, what I'll call axes to it. Uh, as I already said, there's a social axis, there's an economic axis, there's a political axis, there's a practical axis. Um, and there's a scientific axis. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, problems really um, are only um, uh, dealt with in, in a relatively small way uh, by bringing science uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to bear on it. Um, so, but I'm going to be a little, crit a little critical of scientists, and, and, you know, that's of myself as well, to some extent, in that um, scientists can sometimes... Uh, not understand that multi-dimensionality. And they have uh, what I would call a, quite a low-dimensional view of problems. Um, uh, we, 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 we build ourselves into specializations, so we can be a geologist or we can be a biologist, um, but rarely are we a geologist, biologist, and a social scientist. And actually, a lot of the dimensions of problems in government are social problems. The reality is that most of the problems government deals with are to do with people. This planet would work quite well without the people. And governments are governing people, and people are the problems. Now, you know, they're also the solutions. So like, like, I'm not having, I'm not got a downer on people, um, but, but, but the reality is that the, the nub of most of the problems governments deal with is people, and therefore they are fundamentally social problems. So I, I've, I started as, in my life as a, as a fairly hard-boiled physiologist, and I've moved into kind of large-scale environmental science, and I'm new, now moving into what I would call as large-scale social science in government. And that's been a natural transition through my, uh, my sort of academic career. I wouldn't call myself a social scientist, but I try and work the social science areas uh, as much as I can. Um, the other thing is that... Um, uh, that, that, that science is often brought a little bit too late to, uh, to, to the arguments to have effect. Now, this is an, an issue that uh, I, I work, I struggle with a, a huge amount of the time in that scientists sometimes, by government, um, 
seen on, as being a technical, technic, technically based solution for a problem that already exists. Uh, in other words, scientists have brought in and said, well, actually, we've got this problem, so you know, tell us how to solve it. So it could be we, we want to, we're, 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 we're fishing fish stocks, we're taking fish out of the sea, tell us how many fish there are in the sea. So it's a technical problem. Scientists are very good at designing the mechanism to go and find out how many fish there are in the sea and then uh, deliver that information back. Um, scientists are not brought into the problem at the stage of, of, of asking the question, well, should we go and fish those fish in the sea? And if we do want to fish them, how should we go about that? Um, I, and one of my jobs I, is to try and get science into those early discussions about the development of policies. So policies, uh, policies are what runs government. I mean, many people, I think, don't think really understand policy. I don't think I understood it before I came into government. But policies are what runs the system. And... Um, uh, uh, you have uh, really two sides of policy. You have policy delivery, so you've created the policy and you deliver the policy. So badger culling is the delivery of a policy to try and get rid of, as part of the delivery of policy, to try and get rid of bovine tuberculosis. Um, but actually there's a development phase of that uh, um, when there's a bigger question is being asked about, well, how do we get rid of bovine tuberculosis? Even do we want to get rid of bovine tuberculosis? Um, and sometimes having scientists in that um, uh, discussion uh, actually asks different questions to the ones where people just go straight in and say, with bovine tuberculosis, obviously we want to get rid of it. You know, it's, it, th th that's a no-brainer. But actually somebody like me might say, well, actually, why are you asking that question? What, is, that, is that the right question to, to, to address? I might come back to that, to that one later on if I've got time. Um, uh, uh, scientists, if, 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 if we're not involved in that earlier stage of the process, we can actually be entrained into trying to answer the questions that the policymakers want us to answer, rather than uh, thinking from first principles about questions. So sometimes, actually a lot of the time, the scientists involved in, in, in trying to help government do, the, do their job are actually asking sub-questions of much bigger questions and sometimes are the wrong questions. And uh, you know, I think that we need to, we need to think from, from the ground upwards, in other words, think, think, think from the basics um, upwards. Now, uh, a point that I might come back to in a few minutes as well is that science can become politicised um, if we're not careful because... Uh, um, if we, if, 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 if science gets involved in the argy-bargy of that uh, space of uncertainty, then uh, scientists themselves actually be can become uh, part of that political argument. Um, and I would have said that's insidious, dangerous and bad for science, and I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll pick up on that in, in a few minutes. Um, and sometimes scientists don't do it by intention, but actually it happens anyway, because that's the way they're manoeuvred into that position of becoming politicised. Um, and scientists also can become advocates. Now, I, I, I have no problem about scientists working for environmental NGOs. Um, I, I do have a problem when scientists start working for environmental NGOs and then start standing up and defending a position that an NGO has had on, a scientific, uh, on, on scientific grounds, uh, possibly politi political grounds as well. And uh, so th there, there are certain boundaries beyond which I, th I think scientists shouldn't go, and I, I will expand on that in a few minutes. Um, now, there are some common misconceptions about uh, how evidence or science is used or misused in government, and I've put some sort of generalised quotes up here. That, uh, which I've heard, I've heard all of these. So politi politicians do not use science and ignore the evidence. Actually, my experience is that, the, that that's not the case. Uh, you know, in, in the vast majority of cases, they are using as much of the evidence as they can, and they are putting it into this mix of other things they have to take into consideration. And people who say that are normally people who are not happy with the outcome. 
Um, that doesn't mean to say that the politicians have not used the science. It's perfectly acceptable for me as a scientist to say to a politician, well, actually, the science says this, and therefore, you know, the option based on scientific advice would be that, and the politician go off and do something very different. As long as that politician says why they're doing it, I don't think there's a problem with that. And I, I certainly wouldn't object uh, to that, because they have got reasons for doing it. That's why they're elected, after all. Uh, government only uses the science that supports its case. Actually, again, that, that, is, that is miles away from uh, the reality. Actually, that reality sits much more in some of the other advocates for, uh, um, uh, for, for, for particular activities or particular positions on, on uh, controversial issues. Uh, government is unbelievably constrained in what it can and cannot do, mainly by, uh, because, of, because of legal challenge. Um, I think it's a surprise even to ministers when they step into their roles uh, in government to find uh, just how little power they actually have. Because when they get their briefings from, um, from officials that say, here's your options, and they, get, maybe you, they usually get two or three options, uh, actually, they're not very different from each other a lot of the time. And the, the kind of option that they would like to do is way left of centre. Um, and it's uh, just impossible to deliver because actually it would be illegal. You know? um, uh, and you know, the, the fact is that DEFRA is being challenged legally the whole time about its decision-making process. And if DEFRA did not use proper process, which is actually laid down in Treasury rules, Every policy has an impact assessment done of it, and every impact assessment inputs all the evidence that's available. Um, and that is, that is then independently peer-reviewed before a policy is put forward and approved by, by ministers. Now, that is a very rigorous process. So government does use evidence. That is my personal view. Um, it may not appear that way a lot of the time, uh, because once it gets into the public domain and is mangled around by press comment and other people's comments and things like that, um, it, it, it doesn't always, always look that, like that. But actually, government does use science uh, and evidence uh, very well. Independent scientists are not listened to. Um, well, actually, the next quote is independent scientists are independent. Uh, and, and, and actually, one of the problems is that, and it comes back to the politicization issue, which I'm going to come back to in a minute, um, that, is that independent scientists are often viewed as not being independent. Uh, and uh, the truth is that I don't think there is such a thing as an independent scientist. All of us come from a particular social point of view, um, and uh, there, there, there is a lot of suspicion on the part of the po politicians who look at scientific advice uh, that's coming at them um, all the time about what are the motives for, 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 for behind that scientific advice. Um, uh, and, and to some extent, um, you know, I, I would agree with that. There are different motivations behind scientific advice. Um, why have we funded a certain area of science in the first place? Um, uh, and actually, sometimes, um, sometimes the reasons behind that are actually fundamentally politically uh, embedded. Uh, government is in league with big business. Well, I've never seen any evidence of that at all. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, it can't really happen, at least at the official level, is that virtually everything I do and everything I write is in the public domain. So anybody here could, could put an FOI request in and get all my emails on particular subjects and things like that. So, you know, on neonicotinoid pesticides, for example, I've had FOIs saying, how, t how many times have I spoken to the big chemical companies about, um, uh, about neonicotinoids and things like that? Um, it, it's, it's all in the public domain. Um, so there is, no, there is no possibility, in my view, that, that government is in league with big business, necessarily. Um, it's all the government's fault, and the government is responsible. Yeah, um, actually, uh, one of the problems I think that we face is that, uh, or that the government faces, is trying to uh, persuade people that government actually does not have any strings to pull a lot of the time, and actually uh, that the wider stakeholder community, particularly with 
with uh, important environmental issues, actually does hold a lot of the strings. Um, that's not to say that government doesn't have responsibilities. Yes, of course it does. But, uh, but actually, uh, the, it's, it's, uh, the power that government has is much less, less than people think. Uh, it's been peer-reviewed and published, so it must be right. Well, anybody who's a scientist will know that that's not necessarily true. There are some very good science out there, but there are some, some areas of science where I look at the literature. They're not my specialist areas, but I look at the literature and wonder, is there anything I can really believe here? Uh, and and I, I know that there are some, some, some really good papers amongst some, about this, this sort, of, uh, uh, sort of body of literature that there is. Uh, but identifying the good ones as opposed to the ones that, that are really not very good is, is really quite difficult. Um, uh, so science, including economics and social science, is a firm foundation for policy making. Well, I've actually already uh, said, actually, it is. It is a good foundation, but it's only one, one small part of the whole story. So um, I'll need to speed up a bit. Role of CSAs. Well, here's a bunch of chief scientific advisors, uh, uh, mostly men, unfortunately. Uh, so we need more female chief scientific advisors. Um, uh, uh, Charlotte Watts here, who's the chief scientific advisor at DFID, um, uh, the Department for International Development. Uh, and then various other ones. Uh, uh, one who's uh, uh, sort of in the top middle there is um, Peter Glockman, who's the chief scientific advisor to the, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. But the rest are all UK-based uh, uh, chief scientific <coughs> advisors. Um, uh, and that, this is a kind of core, of, core group in Whitehall. Uh, there's a, one or two other ones around us, uh, and I'm putting them all up here. Um, but we're just, most of us are academics, taken out of academia, stuck in government departments. Uh, and it, I think it shows you a certain degree of confidence that government can just take somebody, stick them in, give them free reign. You know, you can say anything you want. Uh, that, uh, you know, and, and, and none of us kind of step out and say, hey, there's something going on here which, which you really want to hear about. You know, so uh, that, and, and we would say that if, if we saw it. So there's confidence in government. Um, so how should a CSA behave, Chief Scientific Advisor? What are the skill set? Well, uh, independence, as much as independence can be, uh, as I said before. Integrity, honesty, object, objectivity, impartiality. Those are, those, are, those are characteristics that you would expect of any, any scientist. And actually, any civil servant uh, as well. Um, authoritative, respected, wise. I mean, it's, it's great to have a few grey hairs, actually, because when you walk into the office of a Secretary of State who's 20 years younger than you, uh, you kind of can have a certain kind of gravitas of age and wisdom and all that sort of stuff. And, and it, it can help, um, not always, because actually they know their own minds. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, sometimes, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, but, but actually something I might come back to later on is about a uh, chief scientific advisor needs to be able to build trust amongst uh, uh, senior officials who, who, who I work with and also the ministers who I work with. Breadth of interest, I need to, I mean, I am a specialist in kind of marine and complex system science, uh, but I need to know everything from the chemistry of plastic bags to the dynamics of fish stocks to uh, sort of uh, um, uh, flood, f uh, um, hydrodynamics of floods and uh, a whole range of other things, bees, neonicotinoid pesticides, etc. Uh, political intelligence, really important. Really understand your audience, uh, understand what's going on in their minds, uh, read the, the signs amongst other people about what's, what's happening. Uh, thick skin is important uh, because you get criticized. I've been quite heavily criticized in the press on occasions, quite unfairly, obviously, but uh, um, uh, you, 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 do need a, you do need a thick skin. Um, able to listen as much as talk. Well, I'm doing an awful lot of talking now, but I do like to listen to people, and hopefully we'll get, get to something about that in a minute. Um, organizational intelligence. When you step into government, you're stepping into a massive organizational structure. So, so DEFRA has 22,000 staff. Uh, that's a big structure, and I found, found when I walked in, I was one of the five people running it. So straight from university, straight in. Fortunately, the people around me were really good at it. 
You know, they are skilled. That's what they are there to do. That's, they've grown up through the civil service. They know how to run it. They don't expect me to do it, but they do expect me to, to be part of the, the process. And I've learned a lot in the last five years. So organizational intelligence is really important. You've got to be a bit of an opportunist as well, because actually sometimes uh, doors open for making changes uh, or, or having effects. And you need to understand when a particular door opens. Uh, and it's a political door. This is part of political intelligence as well, is that sometimes ministers simply just won't listen to things because they don't have the political power to do anything about it. Uh, so understanding what's going on uh, and being able to then take an issue to a minister or a senior official at a time when actually it's going to land well with them is actually quite important. You've got to be a bit of an opportunist. And be patient. You know, uh, uh, you, 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 you do have to understand that things in government take time. Uh, and sometimes some of the, 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 the pet things that one might want to do will never find an opportunity while you're in post. You know, it, just, it just happens that way. And then at the bottom, I've, 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 I've given in large letters that a CSA is mainly working on strategic issues. Now, what do I mean by strategic? I mean sort of cross-cutting and long-term rather than tactical and operational issues. So, I, I, you know, while I maybe might get my sleeves rolled up on particular uh, issues like the chemistry of plastic bags or like badgers and TB, most of the time I'm just dealing with looking at the organizational structure and saying, is that functioning well? And are we getting the organization onto the front foot in order to make sure that in the long term we produce policies that are really uh, fit for purpose? Um, constraints, communication of complex ideas, coming back to the point about communication. Um, communicating the limits to the evidence that there are. It, and, and, and I can't sort of overstress over, over this too much, that there is an immense amount we don't know. And, and actually, this comes, this comes to the, the fore in, in, in difficult situations. It, it's easy for us to focus on the things we do know. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with excuse, to, excuse me, Ian, but, you know, when you're on television, you're telling people about things we do know. Actually, when it comes to difficult decision making, the things that really drive it are the things we don't know. Um, uh, and, and, and there's an awful lot of what we don't know out there. Media inadequ in inadequacies. So, so a lot of the environmental uh, issues that I deal with are very complicated. They're technically complicated. And the media is not very good at translating that technical complexity to people in ways that people can fully sort of grasp and understand. Uh, that's not necessarily a criticism, because it's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, but the, the, there is inadequacy there of communication. Um, science professionalism. Uh, I put that in there because I think that some scientists will stand up in, uh, in public and make uh, a particular case, which is is not a balanced case. Um, and this comes back to my issue about politicization, and I'll, I'll just cover this now. One of the problems with uh, scientists being advocates is that as soon as you start to advocate a particular solution to a particular problem, those people who do not uh, align with that solution will stop listening to you. And as a scientist, actually, you become less effective if people stop listening to you. I think that we as scientists have to be very good at communicating to everybody what the scientific information says in a balanced way and to leave it to them to make informed decisions on their own, not to tell them what they should be doing. If we start telling people what they should be doing and they find that difficult, then they will stop listening to us. And we end up not being able to communicate with some of the people we most want to listen to us. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute with, uh, with respect to climate change. Um, another issue 
How am I doing? Oh, oh I, I, I'm going to run out of time, aren't I? Um, I'm going to move on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm going to... Uh, <coughs> trust in the evidence base. Okay. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier on the problem I have with looking at some areas of, of evidence uh, in the scientific literature and finding that actually uh, there's not a lot there that I can necessarily f um, um, uh, believe in. Now, uh, you know, we've got um, uh, bees up here, neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, are, actually, there's a huge amount of literature there that is really misleading. Um, uh, it's, it's contradictory and it's misleading, and some of it's not very well. Um, so the experimental designs are not particularly good. Um, and I just give that as one area uh, where, there are, where there are problems. So I, as a, as, a, as a chief scientific advisor, have to be able to try to um, understand the, um, the landscape of evidence that there is there and try to pull out the bits that are believable as opposed to the bits that are not believable and try and transmit to ministers and senior officials those, those bits that are believable. Um, I also am governed, so I'm not a t total, f totally free individual just to say what I want, although I have a lot of freedom. Uh, and I have a science advisory council uh, which uh, has, sits on top of a number of statutory committees uh, and then we have ad, ad hoc advisory committees, and they put advice into me, CSA, and ministers, and the policies, policy areas as well. Um, and we have probably about 300 scientists and social scientists who give their time to us through this committee structure. So it's not just the chief scientific advisor, it's not just my opinion, it's an opinion of a large body of individuals and the Science Advisory Council, I work very closely with them because I want them to look in on what I am doing so that they can feel happy about how I am behaving and things like that because it's important that I am, I am credible. It's important I do not go, um, go native. But I just put this up because this is uh, the golden rule that I think I as a CSA, but I think also scientists generally, uh, have to look at is to never become a part of the problem. And I think scientists sometimes uh, do this. I, I, I had an experience before I ever became a CSA of where I was working on a, 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 a major controversial issue actually in the North, North Pacific and it, it was relating to marine mammals and fisheries in the North Pacific. Um, uh, anybody can look up the literature and find out what it was about. Uh, but the reality is that I felt I was becoming a part of the problem. And I, I, when I felt that, I dropped it as a subject. I, and I've never done anything on it since because I was be, being drawn in to the problem because it's a wicked problem and it was drawing me in. And with, with a chief, as a chief scientific advisor, it's really important not to get drawn into the problem. It'd be very easy to do that. Um, communication. Uh, of, of difficult issues. Um, uh, there's, I, I mentioned climate change earlier on. I think that's one area where science has become politicized, where scientists have provided the solution to people and said, believe us, take it. And people have said, oh, I don't think I'm going to do that. Thank you very much. And by the way, I don't believe you anymore. Now, that's not a good thing, because actually what they're saying is probably correct. But it's the way they say it that's important. Um, moving on, um, I'm going to move on from that as well. Um, let's just move to here. This, this one. Um, if we want a lesson in communication, simple messages are really important. And I'm putting this graph up. It's actually a, a, a graph that comes from the European Association for Scientific Academies report um, um, on, um, on climate risk. Um, and what it shows is four lines, which are average lines of trends. Uh, and you can probably read it here. The red one at the bottom is geophysical events. Uh, and then there's the green one is meteorological events. The blue one is hydrological. And the, uh, the, the sort of yellow or orange one is climatological. Uh, and through time along the, 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 the x-axis. 
And the interesting thing about this is that the geophysical events are not really increasing very much, whereas all the other ones are increasing. Now, when I saw that, uh, and it was published in 2012, and I had a Secretary of State then who was a climate skeptic, he didn't believe in climate change, I took that straight to him and said, there's your evidence, because the, the, the y-axis is basically the amount of money insurance is having to pay out on each of these uh, types of processes. So this is real money, he understood that, it's real money that the insurance industry is paying out. Um, and what, what's more, there's an upward trend here. The control, which he totally got, is the geophysical events, because they're not climate, they're not climate driven. Um, so if you look at the, the gap between the three upper ones and the lower one there, that's telling you the cost of climate change, potentially. Now that one graph almost, not quite, almost changed his mind. But he was just about to go into the House of Commons to stand in front of the dispatch box to answer questions, and climate was one of the questions. And he took it with him. He actually had it in front of him in the House of Commons. He didn't use it in the end, but he took it with him. So if that's a lesson in communication, it's got to be simple, clear messages. And even people who are sceptical can pick it up then. Um, very quickly, use and misuse, and we can maybe come back to these in discussion. Um, uh, very good example of um, use of evidence, and this is where DEFRA really invested in evidence and got the whole system on the front foot. So science really, science and economics here, really played a major role in driving forward um, uh, uh, policy. And that's something called the National Ecosystem Assessment. It was my predecessor was, was mainly, was partly responsible for, for pulling this forward, uh, Bob Watson. Um, and this is an economic assessment of, of landscape. And, it, and what it did was to provide the practical and theoretical underpinning for the concept of natural capital. Um, and the, I, I can't preempt the 25 year environment plan that we're just about to publish sometime if we're allowed to publish it in the near future. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's no secret that DEFRA is very keen to see a valuation process being put on the natural uh, system that, uh, that, that we, um, uh, we have. Uh, uh, and that includes the biodiversity, and it includes uh, the sort of fixed assets like, um, like coal measures and like oil. Uh, and, and, and gas for fracking and those sorts of things, um, as well as some of the, the more fluid assets like water resources, like forests, like fish stocks. Um, and the economists think they can put values on that. Um, and I think we can put values on some of it. And if we can put values on it, we can then potentially account for the, the, these fantastic assets we have in, in things like the national accounts. So we could have a different form of, of, of gross domestic product, for example, which included the amount of natural capital that we have expended or that we have expanded. Um, so so that, that gives you a, an impression of the, the, the real value that sits uh, within uh, uh, a piece of research that was done um, uh, in the early 2000s between 2000 and 2010 that was sponsored by, uh, by DEFRA. And, and it's got the potential to drive the agenda for the next 20, 30, 40 years, maybe forever. Bovine tuberculosis, this, this graph's a little bit out of date, but this is showing the kind of the progression of bovine tuberculosis in this country from uh, the, the mid 1950s through to near the present day. Um, uh, really the, the, the um, the, the line you want to look at is the red line, really. Um, yeah, we have got a problem with bovine tuberculosis in this country. It's mainly down in this part of the country. Many of you down here will see it, um, it talked about in the newspapers. Um, there are all sorts of measures uh, that are put in place in order to be able to try and combat the disease. And you'll see that the, the red line is, although it's very wiggly at the top, is actually flat. And actually, the disease is notionally under control. It's not being, being driven downwards, but it's notionally under control. And that's mainly because of cattle control measures that are in place and have been in place for some time. 
Um, uh, we know it's called bovine tuberculosis, and we know that it's mainly a disease of cattle. Uh, it's transfer between cattle. Um, and it's also a disease, unfortunately, of some wildlife, including badgers. And we know that they are part of the disease cycle. Um, if we were to use standardised epidemiology uh, or epidemiological treatments for bovine tuberculosis, and this is me as a chief scientific advisor speaking, the chief veterinary officer might, might disagree with this, but if, if we were to use standardised uh, epidemiology, we could, we could deal with the bovine tuberculosis problem quite quickly. But what would standardised epidemiology look like? Well, it would look like um, actually removal of most of the badgers from the landscape, at least in a, in a phased way. It would look like um, whole herd slaughter. So when we find a reactor in a herd, we usually just take the reactors out. We would have to get rid of the whole herd. Uh, and that's what was done in Australia, and they have got rid of bovine tuberculosis. Okay? We could do that, but we don't do that. And we don't do it because there are two components to this problem. There's an epidemiological problem, and there's a social problem. And that social problem is it's a very interesting problem. It's a problem relating to farmer behaviour. It's a problem relating to the economics of farming, the economics of rural, um, uh, uh, rural communities. Uh, it's also a problem relating to how people view the landscape. So uh, it's some people um, uh, don't agree with intervention in the landscape, and some people do agree with intervention in the landscape. So there are lots and lots of social dimensions to this. And that's what means that you cannot take the, the, the purest epidemiological approach to dealing with the problem. We might come back to that one in discussion. Ash dieback was another issue. Some of you will remember it. It's about four years ago now that uh, it hit us. Um, it was an interesting one in that, that um, actually we've had tree disease coming into this country for some time. This graph shows the increase in numbers of tree diseases coming in. I can't remember what A and B it stands for, but, but there's an increase in the number of tree diseases coming in. Uh, and suddenly we get another tree disease. Not a great tree disease, I have to say. It was, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a good one, uh, but, but we get another one. And suddenly we get massive social amplification of the problem. In other words, it's all over the press. Uh, nobody quite knows why it's happened. Uh, DEFRA is reeling with the, uh, with the effects of this. Uh, but nevertheless, it has shifted DEFRA into a very different way of thinking uh, about how to combat tree disease. But I, as a chief scientific advisor, I, I produced a, a review in, in science uh, of tree disease with some colleagues. And basically what that says is it's, it's driven by trade. So we have a choice here of do you want tree disease or do you want to trade? Because actually you can't shut off tree disease if you, if you, uh, if you don't shut off trade, because it will always happen. It's, it might happen at a slower rate, depending on how much trade you do, but uh, we are partly the per 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 perpetrators of, of tree disease. So we've got to understand, again, the social, the social dimension of the problem. Uh, pollinators. Um, now, pollinators, are, I, you know, I'm not going to spend uh, long in this. The declines in pollinators. Well, actually, if you look at the data, yes, some pollinators have declined, uh, but they're usually habitat specialists. The generalists have not declined, and there is no data about honeybees. We don't know if they're declined or not. And of course, honeybees are domesticated species, so that if they have changed in numbers, it's, it's, it's in indicative of the number of beekeepers, not actually honeybees. But that complexity doesn't come through in the press discussion the press discussion around this. Um, and of course, what's become the icon of this is something called neonicotinoid pesticides. So the, 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 the way the message is being transmitted is that neonicotinoid, if we, the, the implication is, if we get rid of neonicotinoid pesticides, it deals with our pollinator problem. No, it doesn't. Neonicotinoid pesticides are a part of the problem, but they are not even the most significant part of the problem. The most significant part of the problem is large-scale landscape change. If indeed there is a problem at all. Now that's almost sacrilege to say that, even, even amongst people in DEFRA, but it's, it's my right as an independent to actually question whether we have in the UK a problem with pollinators. 
And that's quite a controversial statement. Um, I finish with air quality because it's just the thing I'm dealing with at the moment. It's just, you know, these things come through in waves. Fortunately, they don't come through simultaneously with each other. They come through in waves. And, of course, air quality is an interesting one because, actually, all the time, all through the time of dealing with bovine TB and badgers, I was kind of looking at that problem and saying, why are we spending so much time on such a small issue when, in fact, we're killing about, or we're, yeah, we're, we're reducing the lifespan of about 50,000 people a year with low air quality, and yet we're spending you know, an awful lot of time worrying about whether we're culling badgers or, or bo we're getting rid of bovine TB. Isn't this the more important problem? Uh, but it's quite difficult to get people to, you know, even in the, in the policy space or ministers to move to actually um, take that bigger picture into account. I obviously believe that that is a bigger problem. And of course, it's now coming back to us and we have to deal with it. Um, so the, the, the Supreme Court has, has ruled that, that uh, the government needs to do more to control air quality. Um, but again, I think the messaging on this is actually really quite garbled. Um, if there is the biggest uncertainty in the whole air quality argument is the number of years of life lost as a result of poor air quality. Um, the epidemiology, in other words, is really, really uncertain. Now, a lot of people will say, well, actually, the government doesn't do enough in order to be able to just measure the amount of uh, nitrogen dioxide or nitrous oxide or whatever it might be that's in the atmosphere. Um, or PM 2.5 or PM 10, whatever the pollutant is. Um, actually, the government has a pretty accurate way of estimating the amount of that stuff that's out there. What we don't really know is when people are actually breathing the stuff in, what are the real effects on their health? And that's very difficult to find out. Um, but, you know, I think the argument is now being won that even if you don't know what the effects are, if there's indi an indication that there's an effect, then we should be acting on that indication because the effects are, are potentially really quite large and they're insidious. And of course, they emerge as health problems are associated with circulatory problems, breathing problems, uh, chronic type problems that many people have may be related to low air quality. Um, uh, so something has to be done about it. But something is being done about it, and it's been done for a long time. So see the, the graph here shows actually the changes in air quality in the UK. So if you take, take that and project it downwards, if we continue to do what we need to do, we will get to better air quality. But it just takes a while. So that's 200, 2013 there. So if you project that downwards by about 2030, 2035, we should have perfect air. <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. I don't think we'll ever have perfect air. Uh, but the reality is that we, in order to get perfect air, we need to shift completely from the kind of uh, energy use system we have. We need to shift away from hydrocarbons. We certainly need to shift away from burning hydrocarbons in vehicles. Um, and we need to shift away from um, uh, burning uh, large amounts of hydrocarbon uh, within uh, power stations. So my final message is that um, sometimes there's a great payoff because if we did that based on air quality because people really care about their own health, think what it would do for climate change. Thank you. I thought you were being um, extremely kind on politicians. <laughs> um, there must be somebody in the audience that um, <laughs> might report back. I don't know. Anyway, um, what surprises me is that um, what we hear from government ministers is contrary to what you say. I, from what ministers have said, the cabinet, I would have thought if you went round the cabinet and asked them if they believe in climate change, I would imagine that uh, very few of them do believe in it. Um, they have 
the present government has undone so many of the policies to reduce our carbon footprint in this country. And they are the only country, we are the only country in Western Europe that has actually increased mm. the subsidies to fossil fuels, while at the same time reducing any support for renewables. That flies completely contrary to what mm. you were saying. Oh, well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm not here to stand up to, um, uh, to protect politicians in any way whatsoever. Um, they can do that themselves. Uh, secondly, um, uh, you know, the messages I give to you are the same ones that I give to politicians. But thirdly, remember what I said about um, politicians being um, uh, very constrained in what they can and cannot do. We, we, I think we really do believe, and I certainly believe before I stepped into this job, that actually politicians really were quite free to, to think and do and say what they want. Actually, they're not. They're, they're very constrained by, uh, by their own party politics. They're very constrained by uh, parliamentary politics at any one time. They're very constrained by economics. Um, uh, and sometimes, I, and I can say this without, without um, sort of naming it any names, you know, you, I, I can sit in rooms with politicians and it's just like sitting with people here who have the same, same problems, same beliefs, all that sort of stuff. It's just that if I was to take you and stick you in their position, actually you would find it very difficult as well. So, so I, 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 it's, I, know, I know that's, that sounds like, like sounds a bit trite, but it's, but it's true uh, because I see them on a day-to-day -day basis having to make really difficult decisions which are actually contrary to their fundamental, fundamentally what they really believe and want to do. Some of them, you're right, some of them are just not, not convinced. And, and of course, you know, the government at the moment has a particular view about the importance of making sure that uh, the economy is right, because once you get the economy right, then climate change uh, issues can be enacted more easily. Um, but of course, there's a big question about the, the greening of the economy. Um, but, you know, I, 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 sit on, I sit on committees about innovation, um, uh, you know, energy innovation, which is all about trying to find intelligent ways around um, reducing the amount of, uh, amount of carbon we, uh, and, and methane and other greenhouse gases that we, uh, we produce. And those committees would not exist if the politicians did not want them to exist. They do exist, and they do work at trying to find these solutions. Um, it sometimes just doesn't come over that way. It's another complex problem. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to... Um, I'm not trying to stand up for the current position because it could be, you know, politicians could step out into the, into the limelight and say, you know, we need to drive this faster. Um, but they feel very politically constrained not to do so because actually if they did that, some of them might find themselves not being politicians anymore. And that's, that's their problem. On a day-to-day -day basis, that's their problem. And, and sorry, once you're not a politician anymore, you have no influence. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, do you think it's actually possible to have um, environmental politics, given that politics is essentially anthropocentric, whereas a lot of the environmental problems aren't necessarily, but our viewpoint when we think about politics and policies is all about people and things like you just said about people thinking about their longevity and their position and whether they yeah. can maintain their constituency. All of that can happen, but climate change isn't going to stop and wait for those things. And I, I really struggle to see how those two fundamentally different things can ever marry in a, in a way that has a significant impact. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, there is environmental politics. There's, no, I, I, there's absolutely no doubt. There, it's a part of bigger politics. Uh, and, of course, it plays into, as I said, into the politics around economic growth. You know, how are we going to achieve, you know, continuing economic growth 
while decarbonizing the economy? There's a big question. Um, and of course, that's a, it's, a, it's a fundamentally, it's a technical question, but it's also a political question as well. Um, and uh, I think the politics of that are really, really important. Um, because what politics does, I mean, sometimes I think we look at politics and think, um, you know, we'd be better off without it. Actually, it's what, it's what makes, it's what, it's what drives the decision-making process. It's a crucible in which all this stuff gets mixed up and, and decisions get spat out of it in one way or another. Um, uh, and sometimes we agree with them and sometimes we don't agree with them. Um, but it's about democracy and it's about making sure that people are bought into it. And, and you know, sometimes I kind of, kind of look at the Houses of Parliament and think, well, wow, what, what a... What a mess, you know. Uh, you know, all these people arguing with each other and everything else. But gosh, it's better than going to war with each other, you know. And, and that's, that's kind of the alternative. If we didn't have that as, a, as a, a pressure valve where all these things get, you know, all these people come as representatives and they, 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 they go into the House of Commons and they let off steam on our behalf and they debate the issues and you know, by a process, a decision comes out. It's, it's, it's actually, I find it quite rewarding to see that happening because the alternatives are really awful. Now, that's, that's and then the environment plays into that because the environment is becoming a bigger and bigger political issue and it will go on becoming a bigger political issue because I think that the environmental stresses we are causing are very significant, and they're going to get bigger and bigger. And if we don't, uh, if we don't address them, we will. In fact, I think we're, it's too late to address all of them. So we are going to experience some of the, the negative outcomes of that. And again, our parliamentary democracy is going to be really important to sorting that out. Okay. So just to finish up, and I guess what, why, who decides, and how is it decided that it's better to have continuing economic growth than it is? Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not making a value judgment as to whether that's better or not, but, but uh, that, that, is, that is the way the government of the day has decided that it wants to pursue the problem. It wants to grow its way out of the problem rather than say, hey, wait a minute, we can't, we can't, we can't have any more growth until we sort, sort the environmental problem here. And of course, that's... That, that, that's, that's how, I mean, I can understand why they don't want to do that, because actually you won't sort the environmental problem if you don't have, have growth, because actually what will happen is that they will get voted out of office and somebody else will go in who does want economic growth uh, in order to survive, uh, sort the environmental problem, because the, the alternative is too painful for people to actually contemplate. It means that, uh, that there's going to be a slide in standards of living um, as a result of uh, climate impacts, and we already see it with respect to um, the kind of the subsidies there were for um, offshore renewable energy, you know, have been withdrawn and all that sort of stuff. And, and that's partly because actually they were producing perverse behaviours. People found ways around them, they were making money out of them, but not achieving the objectives at the end of the day. So the, the, there's, again, I, I don't think there's any, so, any clear solution to something like this. Um, what, what, I, I, what I do have a lot of faith in is the fact that our democracy produces a certain outcome that actually, at the end, is marching us kind of in the right direction. But it's not one that I think many people in this room, I suspect, would like. It's not one that's, that many people in this room see happening fast enough. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that worries me as well. But I do understand that actually there, there is only a certain speed with which some people, some politicians can move, otherwise they won't be politicians anymore. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, it was a really interesting talk and I thought the political insights were really useful. I kind of guess I want to challenge you on one thing which is you were talking with some concerns about scientists being biased, and you talked about the importance of balance and objectivity, and yet there's a lot of research into communicating controversial issues that would actually suggest 
but it's not possible to present a balanced stance on a values issue. And that actually in some ways it might be better if people were just upfront about their values rather than as scientists pretending that they yeah. don't have any. So I guess I'd just like to hear a bit more. Yeah from you about the communications one? Well, I, I think that's a very, very fair challenge. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose I just, I take an opposite view to that. Um, and that's that, um, I think that, y y y I think you're right that it's extraordinarily difficult for anybody to be totally objective about, about things. Um, on the other hand, I, I think from a professional perspective, at the very least, um, a bit like lawyers or a bit like accountants who have a kind of professional code and, and doctors as well, professional code which says that when I, am, when I got my professional hat on, I am behaving in this, in this cer certain way and when I am acting as an individual citizen of the, of the country, I am behaving in a different way. I've got a different hat on. And I think that the problem is that people misinterpret sometimes what scientists are saying um, because they don't know whether they're acting as objective uh, commentators or an, or, or, on an issue or they're acting as individuals who have a particular point of view and are advocating a particular outcome. Um, I think with some of the other professions it's, it's much clearer because if if you're up there on television as a doctor or an accountant or something like that, then you will be giving your professional view, or at least you should be giving your professional view, view because actually it's, uh, it's unethical not to. I think in science, we create a confusion uh, amongst the audience about whether we are at the end of the spectrum I'd like to see us at, which is as objective as possible, as opposed to the other end of the spectrum, which is just giving your personal point of view. And by the way, I'll put some science on the top of this as well, just to convince you that I'm right. Now, you know, I, I, my criticism is more of the science as a profession. I think that we have to be much clearer about the messages we're giving and say, actually, in these circumstances, I'm speaking as a professional, and in other circumstances, I'm giving you my, prof my personal view. So on that point, is there an issue where, um, if you're talking about the data, the information, if you like, can you be providing an independent view of what the consensus is? And then if you're asked what you're going to do about it, what your opinion is, you can go into a platform. I think that would work fine, so long as people know yeah. the circumstances in which... I mean, I have, you, you, you realise I have quite strong views about things, but, uh, and I hope that, that uh, for all of this talk, uh, I've been speaking from a personal perspective. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if I was trying to communicate to a minister or to a senior official or to the public as the chief scientific advisor of DEFRA, I would be much more constrained in what I'm saying because actually I think I need to be very clear about where the evidence sits uh, and where the uncertainty, and, and not step into that s space of uncertainty that I talked about earlier on. It's funny that you were talking about environmental concerns becoming more of a political issue and becoming more to the forefront. Obviously with the situation in America, that hasn't happened and they are completely nonsense in climate change. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you make people care about climate change more than what they see in their own little bubble to yeah. make sure that they, I guess, vote for someone who will make a difference in that area? Well, I, I, you know, the, the problem is that the, the electoral system, the democratic system in the states has produced this, this outcome. And I think, that, I think that we need to step back and say, well, why has it produced that outcome? You know, we, we, we as scientists have, have been um, making the evidence as clear as possible for a very long time. And, you know, what it says is that, well, actually, a lot of the people don't really believe this. And, um, you know, we... I, I, I think rather than questioning the political system, the political outcome, I think we've got to first of all turn that question back in on ourselves and say, have we been packaging the messages in the right sort of way? And it comes to what I've just been talking about, about the politicisation process. Um, and you know, I, I think that the message about climate change 
has been politicized by the scientific community. Uh, and interestingly, just coming down in the train, I, just, I was reading the BBC News website, and there is a, there's, there's now a, uh, or today, there's a, a, a demonstration by scientists in Boston, I think, about climate change. And as, you know, my first reaction to this was, was uh, and, and actually it was given, it, the way it was reported was that many of these scientists don't want to be politicized, but they feel they're forced to do it. And my first reaction was that, was, to that was, I can understand that. I could, I could be one of you. But then my second reaction, more considered reaction, was, I'm not sure that's a good thing. Uh, I, I, and and uh, I, you know, I think it, it would be much better if science was to uh, withdraw from this think strategically about how we want to communicate what we want to do and do it very differently to the way we've done it in the past and start again. Now with climate change, uh, I'm not sure we can start again. Uh, with another issue that I deal with, it's G GMOs, I'm not sure we can start again because actually the, the, the whole, it's culturally embedded now and trying to, to, to you know, take, take that culture out of people's minds is really difficult. I think that we do need to think very carefully about, about upcoming issues. And one of the ones that uh, I feel that we have not got, we, we've uh, still to come, and, is n and we need to think about very carefully, I wouldn't say it's not being communicated carefully, is the issue of resource efficiency. Uh, because actually, uh, my personal view is that climate change is just a subset of resource exhaustion and resource efficiency. And we, did, we need to start communicating the idea that we cannot be so wasteful in future and we need to change our lifestyles in order to deal with that. Now, that's an issue that really hasn't got into the public domain. But boy, we need to get it there. But we need to do it in a very different way to the way we've done it in the past. Um, and uh, if you ask me how, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'll be the next question. Last, last question and then we can have to wait. Oh, you've had your uh, Anyone else before we go to... Oh, someone up there who had not been really seen. Yeah. Um, really touching on the question we've had before, but um, how are you convinced that the government's really got their uh, heart in this? And it's switched on, is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> because on climate change, uh, the IPCC in, in 2007, they fixed the carbon budget. It's a very good way of communicating how much more um, fossil fuels you could burn. And they came up with a budget for future fossil fuels in 2011. And uh, it was 269 gigatons of, of, of carbon left for fossil fuels and cement making. It sounded a lot until you realised they were putting 10 gigatons a year into the atmosphere. Now, that would be a very simple message for politicians to grasp, but I've never heard one ever mention it. So they clearly, if they, if they even <coughs> took it in, they certainly have no intention of passing that on. And surely it's the role of science to convey some of this information more directly and not let them get away with hiding things they don't like. Yes, but I, let, let me just take the, uh, the sort of the numbers you just quoted at me. Um, uh, I mean, I deal with numbers really rather well. I, I mean, I quite like mathematics and, and stuff like that. And I d I've done, dealt with quite a lot in my, in my career. And I, you know, dealt with a lot of numbers and statistics, etc. But actually, uh, the numbers you just quoted at me kind of went, you know, over the top of my head, gigatons, whoa, that's a, that's a big number, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, I, well, I know what it is, but if I was to say that to a minister who's never got, who hasn't got any of that experience, it's just kind of, wow, you know, and to the average member of the general public, yeah, well, it I, is. I didn't give you the context, I mean, the context was, and that was the number of, for us, just a 66% probability of being achieving plus two max. In other words, not exceeding a temperature of plus two, which they're supposed to be committed to. Um, so how many, how many people in the audience totally understand what, what our, our <laughs> colleague here is saying? So, so it, it, I mean, it is the problem. It, it, the, these things are not simple, and communicating them is not easy. Um, it, it's interesting, I, I, I once... Uh, uh, was on a train journey with, with somebody who is a, who is a, is a major pr producer in one of our major television um, um, 
channels uh, or is responsible, is the, is the controller of factual in one of our major tele television channels. And I, I put, this, put this point to him and he said, well, actually, you know, give it to folk like me because actually we know that that's what we do. You know, that's our, you know, the trouble is that, sorry, Ian, it's, it's us scientists who stand up there and try to communicate and we're not very good at it. Whereas there are people who, you know, I don't know, write cartoons like South Park and stuff like that, which people sit and watch and they're amused and actually there are messages there you can get over. There are all sorts of things you can do as a, a producer of the kind of, uh, um, uh, the kind of entertainment that people enjoy looking at and will look at and will actively look at and will, will and you can provide, you can deliver messages, those sorts of ways. You have to be, you have to be honest about it. You can't deliver subliminal messages, but, but there, there, are, there are ways of doing that if we only thought about it. So I'm giving a bit of my answer to how I think we might, might want to do it, but I think we've got to be much more strategic, much more uh, integrated with those who really do know how to communicate uh, in order to get those messages over. And gigatons, is not the way to do it. Sorry. <laughs> well, there's a, there is a, the point is that the public can easily grasp it. If you come up with the fact that there's a limit, and if you go beyond that, you've got virtually no chance of getting the uh, uh, Yeah. Um, and then but, says, but hang on a minute, that, that would mean zero carbon by 2037, which is impossible. So how do, what do we do about that? And the only answer is for you to cut your emissions now to buy yourself extra decades. But, but the problem is that you haven't got to first base because probably 95% of the public um, are, are not totally convinced that two degrees is a problem. For, for, many, for many of them, two degrees, two degrees, thanks very much, that sounds great. Winters will be warmer, you know. You know, uh, absolutely. I think we shall yeah. intend you to yeah. mind, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get even more heated up to three degrees. Uh, well, yeah. and I guess the issue that we're really dealing with is this idea of information and information rather than broader narratives and, and values and ethics and, and that stuff. So um, I, on that base, I'd like to draw to a halt and to, to thank Ian for his talk. Pleasure.